Hello everyone and welcome to episode 14 of Feel the Pedal podcast and also part 2 of this very special talk with none other than Dr. James Morton. As usual, I am your host, Gabriel Martins, and if you've just stumbled upon this episode, know that this is the continuation of part 1, which you can listen on episode 13 prior to this one, and I would totally recommend you to start over there so you can get a proper context of this talk and also know a bit more about Dr. Dr. James Morton and his early times with Team Sky. If you have already listened to episode 13 and you're here for the second part of this interview, let us not waste any more time and resume the groundwork of performance nutrition in pro cycling part 2 with Dr. James Morton, professor of exercise metabolism at Liverpool John Moores University and former performance nutritionist at Team Sky. <laughs> Okay, James, so let's move on to the more nutrition-related questions, specifically one of the research performed by your research group and that you went on to apply with your riders. For a long time, nutrition for endurance events typically focused on carbohydrates as fuel with carb-loading parties despite the context, and your presence on Team Sky really made popular two particular concepts, uh, marginal gains and fuel for the work required, which focus on manipulating carbohydrates to maximize training adaptations in order to promote optimal body composition and enhance peak race day performance. And you've pioneered some of the research leading to strengthen this notion alongside with Sam Imbe, who has been here on the show, talking about this specifically. So uh, my question for you, James, is um, could you tell us how exactly did you came to study uh, these concepts and why did you start applying them with your riders in the first place? What feedback did you get from the riders and what improvements did you see uh, throughout the specific season leading to a Grand Tour event? Yeah, okay. Well, my interest in... Um carbohydrate periodization or tree and low as it was termed originally really came back from the 2005 paper from Copenhagen in Denmark where they used a, a twice per day exercise training model where one, one limb trained twice per day and the other limb trained uh, once every second day um, and basically they seen that the, the twice per day limb had greater changes in aerobic enzyme activity and could have exercise for significantly longer and the implications were that perhaps training 50% of your sessions with low pre-exercise muscle glycogen might lead to a greater training response. Now, in 2009, we then did a study in runners that we were applying to team sport athletes. And we pretty much seen the same thing. In that study, we had three groups. We had one group that trained on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we had two other groups who trained twice per day on a Tuesday, Thursday. And one of those twice per day groups basically depleted glycogen in the morning time and then they consumed a placebo sports drink during the second session. Whereas the other twice per day group performed the same protocol, but this time they consumed a carbohydrate sports drink during the second session. And essentially what we've seen was that some of the oxidative enzymes were significantly upregulated to a greater extent in that twice per day session. But even consuming one bottle of sports drink during that second session almost offset those enhanced training adaptations. And again, at, at that time, I wasn't really interested in, in sport nutrition. It was more sport physiology. I just finished doing my PhD in heat shock proteins, and, and heat shock proteins was the, the primary outcome variable in that particular study. And then when, once we measured some of the oxidative enzymes, I could then quickly see how nutrition or what you eat before, during, and after your training sessions can completely change how the muscle adapts to training. And so then I became really interested in that. And then over the last 10 years, we've had many students come through the lab who have been looking at this in their thesis, Sam being one of them. What I would also say is that a lot of the train low literature has different models for which to restrict carbohydrate, the twice per day one being the, the original model. Of course, you can train fasted. You can have your breakfast after training rather than before training. Maybe it's that you just don't have sports drinks during your training. Maybe it's you restrict carbohydrates afterwards. 
or more recently the sleep low train low model where you do a session in the evening time you then restrict carbohydrate overnight and then you perform a session the next morning now when i went into the world of cycling and i was thinking like how do you use some of that literature in cyclists the difference is is that cyclists only perform one session per day that session usually starts around 10 a.m and it could go on to 2 3 or 4 p.m on that afternoon Mm -hmm. so therefore how do you change the carbohydrate every day for that session when they're only training once per day because you can't really do a sleep low train low or you can't really do a a twice per day session when they've only got the one session per day but what you can do is you can change your carbohydrate at every meal in accordance with the fuel for the work required principle and what that really means then is that you're thinking two or three days in advance because in my time in cycling every training session was different so you would never really do two of the same sessions on consecutive days And so therefore, we then came up with that traffic light system where we would change the carbohydrate at breakfast or on the bike or at lunch or in the evening meal, depending what the session looked like today, but also what did the session look like tomorrow and the day after. And so fuel for the work required then really means adjusting your carbohydrate intake day by day, meal by meal, in accordance with the upcoming workload. Yes, great, James. And this got me thinking, um, athletes such as uh, cyclists and many endurance athletes are used to cut carbs. Um, Would you agree, James, that this could probably be a way of organizing their diet for these athletes who are used to cut carbs rather than simply a way of reducing carbohydrate availability by allowing them to still perform well in highly demanding training sessions? Yeah, it's basically... It's a dietary periodization practice. It's a structured framework for which to govern your choices each day. And I think you're right. A lot of athletes have tried to restrict carbohydrates. But in my experience, they haven't had a structured framework to do. um, And they've got it wrong. They've They've went low for too many days in a row. They've went carbohydrate zero. So they've completely restricted carbohydrate. Their low days are too low. Their high days are too high. Or their high days aren't high enough. Um, And so what we tried to bring to the mix was a real structured framework that was super simple to follow. And I have to say that it is so simple to follow that sometimes I get embarrassed even talking about it. (laughs) But but the riders and the athletes loved it because of how simple it was. And very, very quickly, they could see differences um, to their performance, to their body composition, to how they felt in training. And, And they just learned to follow that framework quite quickly. James, and would you say that this model is uh, scalable? I mean, uh, if a rider goes in a particular training session with a particular intensity and he had a, let's say, a, an amber uh, breakfast with some carbohydrate, would you say that he can then go on in and uh, transition into a red breakfast with none or a minimum carbohydrate without compromising training quality for that particular session? Yeah, absolutely. I think the model is very scalable. Um, The way that we started it off was we would give the riders the recommendations or the recommended ranges for what we thought would constitute red, amber, green. But of course, I was always there with them on a lot of those training sessions. And so then we would have the detailed feedback. We would have the workload data on the bike. We would have all of the um, biochemical data. And, and very quickly then we could adapt it for each rider. To, well, the riders that I was specifically working with, not across the whole team, the, the core guys that I was coaching. Um, and in, in the end, the riders would then be adapting and making the choices themselves because they knew how to do it. So it, it was very much a coaching process of this is what we think, but let's work through it together. And eventually we'll come out the other side and we'll know what works for you. That's a, a great example right there of the importance and probably usefulness of data in cycling. It allows us to show riders directly of uh, a specific strategy on uh, impact on their performance and actually convince them. Um, so, James, in this context, um, you've worked with some of the finest uh, riders of the last decade, uh, each of them with their own metabolic engine. And when you are faced with such riders, uh, when you're dealing with uh, understanding individuals such as Bradley Wiggins, Geraint Thomas, and Egan Bernal, uh, and of course Chris Froome, how do you set how much is red, amber, green for each one of them uh, during training and competition? 
Yeah, well, during training, um, a lot of it would come back to the weight loss goals of when they needed to peak for a particular race. Now, in training, as an example, some of our low carbohydrate days might range from two to five grams per kilo per day. Some of our high carb days in training could be up to eight, nine, ten grams per kilo. Again, in races, sometimes we would go low if we were trying to lose weight during a race. It might be less than four or five. But of course, if it's a real fuel high day in a race, then it would be up over 12, 13, 14. Um, so it was really it was really about coaching them one-to-one. But what I would say amongst the winners is the winners tend to have very similar physiology. Um, and those guys were pretty similar in how they could adapt to a periodized carbohydrate diet. It was the guys who were more carbohydrate dependent or dominant in their metabolism that would often struggle to really adapt to those lower carb rides. They would get there in time. But of course, the the winners have been doing this for a long, long time anyway. Um, So it, it is interesting that the people who won often have very similar physiology and similar nutritional practices. The top guys can ride four, five, six hours on a training day with very little carbohydrate, if any. Um, But those top guys as well, when it comes to those high fueling days, they can also tolerate super high carbohydrate as well. But that's been trained over many years because of the periodization model. And if the low days were low, the medium days were medium, but the high days were also high. And, And that's the difference, I think, was that in our team, we really understood that the polarized model, whereas I think a lot of other teams and athletes across other sports, there doesn't seem to be much difference between the low, medium and high days. They're kind of somewhere all in the middle mm-hmm. where we we really understood the extremes. Fantastic, James. And hopefully we will get into more detail on that later on. Uh, just to summarize what we know about the, the further ramifications of this model, James. Some of your PhD students from Liverpool John Morris University have been performing uh, some additional research on this topic in the past years, uh, researching the impact of low carbohydrate availability, low muscle glycogen in other aspects, such as uh, markers of bone resorption, the effects of graded muscle glycogen, concentrations on performance and cell signaling. So uh, my question would be here, James, how would you sum up what we know about the fuel for the work required framework or the training uh, low model uh, and its possible limitations and what is yet to be studied so we can further improve this model? Yeah, I I think what we do know is that the majority of evidence would suggest that if you restrict carbohydrate before, during and after, an acute training session, you will probably get an amplified cell signaling response and some amplified gene expression responses. However, in those studies that don't show that response, in in my opinion, it tends to be because they haven't went low enough or they haven't restricted carbohydrate enough. And so the big question then is what actually constitutes a train low session? Sure. And, and is it more about what you do before or is it more about what you do during or is it more about how you finish? What I think is that it's how you finish the session. And you've only got to look at um, things like high intensity interval and moderate intensity continuous exercise. You can, see, you can achieve the same signaling response for very different amounts of work done but ultimately you'll create the same stress. It's just how you get there is different. And it's, it's the same with carbohydrate. If you, if you start with low carbohydrate, then you'll finish low. And if you start with high carbohydrate, then of course you just have to keep riding for longer to finish low. But if you finish with the same level of glycogen, it's very likely that you will achieve an identical signaling response. And so therefore, for me, in my mind at the minute, it's about how do you finish the session and how long do you have to go or how, what can you do during the session to determine what level you will finish at. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and I remember talking with, with Sam about this when he was here on the podcast on episode two. Um, we were discussing about the fact that not always we see uh, performance improvements when elevated markers of training adaptations uh, are observed. And also the fact that we might not know how much of these effects uh, we see are due to low carbohydrate availability or low energy availability. And I've been eager to hear your opinion on this, James. Yeah, I, I do think that low energy availability might be playing a role. Although having said that, in our latest paper in the Journal of Physiology, we did try and test that and we didn't see any effect of that. But it might be because we didn't restrict for long enough or for low enough. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to performance, I just think that we're not very good at measuring performance. And certainly we don't do performance trials that are representative of the elite environment. I mean, it's very rare that you see... Sure, sure a six-hour performance test in the lab. And actually, carbohydrate periodization lends itself more towards that type of performance test than a simple 60-minute time trial. So the, the big challenge that we have as researchers is to try and recreate those rides where you are riding for four or five hours at steady state below threshold, and then you have a big threshold effort to finish the race because that's what happens on a, on a big mountain day. It's interesting that one of our PhD students, Mark Fell, who, who also works at Team Sky or Team Ineos now, one of his students has been a dose response of carbohydrate during exercise. And so in that performance trial, we deliberately loaded people with carbohydrate for 36 hours. So they all came into the lab. They had a high carbohydrate breakfast and their pre-exercise glycogen was over 700 millivolts. So that's a carb loaded state. We then exercised them for three hours just below lactate threshold where they consumed 0, 45 or 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Then after the three hours, we took another muscle biopsy. Then we asked them to exercise to the point of exhaustion at 150% of their lactate threshold. And the reason we did that was to try and simulate almost like a mountain attack where you have to try and hold the wheel and it's the person who stops holding the wheel that falls off the back and and even in that particular trial we've seen that the exercise capacity in the zero gram per hour trial was around 150 seconds um, in the 45 it was about 220 seconds and in the 90 gram per hour it was over 300 seconds now people that aren't familiar with the sport might think yeah but 70 or 80 seconds isn't that much when you but that's, that is the difference between completely losing the race. Now, we haven't published that data. Mark's presented that at European College of Sports Science last year, and, and he, mm -hmm. he actually won an award for it. Yes, and I think, one of the reasons, I think one of the reasons why that was a nice study was purely because we had the three-hour exercise trial, and then we had that capacity-type effort. And so really, I think we just need more of those types of studies. I'd take it out even longer, do a five- or six-hour ride, and then a capacity effort. And they can't be done, it's just we just need to recruit the right people. But we'll learn a lot more if we do those types of exercise protocols than let's do a 90-minute steady state and then a 30-minute time trial. I think really the researchers need to have one foot in the athlete camp and one foot in the lab. Um, I mean, even in Mark's study, the dietary protocols that we, we used were pretty much representative of what we've done in Team Sky. So the on-bike fueling was rice cakes, with a mixture of drinks and gels, but the majority of it was from solids. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you see a paper in the literature where they're carbohydrate loaded, they're pre-race fed, and then they consume a mixture of solids, fluids, and gels. Usually the in-race the in race or the in-exercise fueling pattern is limited to fluids. But of course, in the real world, it's not limited to fluids. And, and I'm not sure I would have been able to do that study with Mark unless I'd seen what was the habitual practices that we've done for the last three or four years. I think that's a fantastic point, James. Uh, more than ever, having one foot on the field and another one on research, as you said, may allow us to do better research questions and at least feel the necessity of improving the testing methods to simulate the field conditions as best as possible. 
And another thing I wanted to ask you, James, is about uh, the assessment of muscle glycogen stores. Uh, we need to know how much glycogen or at least how depleted we are to perform such uh, studies. Um, do you believe that the ultrasound technology still needs to be improved when compared to muscle biopsies, as some of your research shows? Uh, are there any specific ranges in muscle glycogen concentrations where this difference between both methods uh, is more evident um well yeah i'm sure you've seen the study that we've just published from harry rutledge's phd yes. i think we, we put three studies in one paper actually in, in medicine science and sports and exercise and we've seen that in both laboratory models and also field-based models of exercise there was no relationship between the ultrasound score and the biopsies so i wouldn't be entirely comfortable that we could use um, ultrasound to non-invasively assess glycogen um, and from a practitioner point of view we might even be making more mistakes if we put all of our eggs in that basket so to speak other non-invasive measurements like MRS but having said that Jose Arida and Will Hopkins have done a fantastic meta-analysis of the glycogen utilization in different types of exercise durations intensities fitness status pre-exercise glycogen levels And so I'm pretty sure that if you go through that paper and you know the fitness characteristics of your subjects and you also know the carbohydrate intakes of your subjects, you'll probably be able to reasonably estimate the glycogen requirement of those sessions, I think. Great, and I will put the link for that particular study uh, in the show notes so that uh, listeners who are curious about this topic can uh, read a little bit more about this. Uh, so, James, three years ago, I, I remember seeing a video of you on cyclingtips.com where, among many other things, you talked about maintaining a protein consistently uh, high during a Grand Tour race and being a believer yourself in protein feedings on the bike. And by that time, I remember being quite surprised to hear that because um, especially with the, the typical idea of uh, picking snacks and energy bars with uh, less protein in them to reduce uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, but you were uh, referring probably to, um, to flat stages where the intensity is not that high, which uh, may allow for uh, more favorable digestive conditions. So, uh, James, I would ask you, what is your current view of the role of protein in the cyclist's diet, uh, whether for training or racing? And uh, do you consider that flat stages are uh, the only type of stages where uh, protein may be important or uh, slash practical to consume on the bike? Yeah, well, the reason why we believed in, in higher protein intakes was primarily from a body composition point of view and maintaining muscle mass especially on those lower carbohydrate days. So if it was a low carbohydrate training day, then we would definitely be recommending higher protein on the bike because of course you will um, oxidize a lot more protein. And if you're calorie deficient, which usually those lower carbohydrate days often are, then you may run the risk of actually losing lean tissue. And indeed I have seen that in my time in the sport. Um, but even in the grand tour, I still think that could happen. Because quite often in the Grand Tour, you're either fighting to um, not put on weight or you're either fighting to maintain weight. Um, and sometimes people actually can lose lean tissue over a Grand Tour. Don't forget, it's 21 days of, of riding six hours a day. Um, and in the context of a, a single stage, if you have your breakfast at 8 a.m. and the stage might not start until 12 noon and then you don't finish the stage until 5 p.m., then you've effectively went eight hours without any protein. And so for us then, if the stage was relatively flat and it didn't start that intense, then in our view, there was no harm in having protein in the first 30 to 60 minutes on the bike. Yes, the typical issue, not with uh, total daily protein, but with uh, protein distribution that In this case, in cyclists, they have less feeding opportunities uh, for this to happen. Uh, just out of curiosity, James, uh, what is the, the range that you were aiming or that athletes, uh, uh, your riders, would uh, uh, usually get to in terms of protein intake? Well, they would, they would definitely be in excess of two grams per kilo per day, um, usually closer to three. So most of that really came from, from food, to be honest, um, The protein on the bike usually came from a, 
a whey protein isolate from the science and sport products or from the whey 20 which is almost like a protein type gel gel um, some t sometimes the riders like protein bars and then of course we have higher protein after the race both from a mixture of food and recovery drinks um, but it was it was definitely in excess of two grams per kilo and closer to three yes and with such an amount of calories it's not hard to surpass the two grams per kilo margin for sure and uh, james I, i believe it would be really interesting to put the spotlight on a rice cakes and food on the bike um tim sky was the first team where i first saw this uh innovative snack being used by the riders and since then rice cakes came to be in a lot of variations with jams nuts uh, philadelphia cheese and uh, i even see there's a growing trend for some uh, food uh, on the bike rather than just relying on bars and gels uh, maybe for good comfort uh, reasons i don't know but the way i see it food like rice cakes uh, paninis and uh, others can be used as a vehicles for other nutrients that may be difficult to provide on the bike, such as uh, protein, uh, sodium, if we add a uh, ham or a soy sauce, and um, even more uh, carbohydrate if we add a jam to the, um, to the rice cakes. And what role do you see here uh, for these foods on the bike? And what feedback did you uh, used to get from your riders on their preferences? I mean, the riders really liked the rice cakes and the paninis. Um, they were a staple of our race day fueling strategy biggest challenge that we had was constantly reinventing the flavors so that people didn't get bored of the flavors. But of course, every food that you consume during exercise has to be functional. It has to be there for a purpose. And the rice cakes are good because it has a mixture of carbohydrate sources. As you said, it will also contain some protein, maybe some fats, maybe some sodium. And of course, the rice itself also contains fluid. So you're kind of hydrating at the same time with a rice cake because of the fluid that it contains. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest challenge was constantly reinventing the flavors and, and the carers were great. Well, they were always coming up with all sorts of flavors. Um, but we had to make sure that they were all standardized and that every rice cake was then carefully delivering the correct portion of carbohydrate and was easier to digest really. James, you must be really tired of this question, but having you here on the show, I, I really needed to take the opportunity to have your comments on Chris Froome's outstanding victory and uh, fueling strategy during last year's Giro d'Italia in stage 19 after attacking on the Colo della Finestre, uh, nailing a solo victory, which we can say that this pretty much decided the winner of uh, the Giro d'Italia. And uh, we all know that cycling can be a, a very unpredictable sport in which uh, a team can have an initial strategy but needs to constantly adapt to other teams moves and strategy as well so my question here james would be was this move planned from the beginning or was it something uh, planned uh, during previous days of the of the race in which you had to set out uh, a con contingency plan for uh, for that specific moment and plan the fueling strategy for Froome's attack Yeah, well, the, the plan on the Finestra was really developed in the two days before that stage. But actually, the way that race was raced kind of all originated from um, being in Israel. So, of course, Chris crashed in uh, the early stages in Jerusalem. And then also, don't forget, we were trying to win the Tour de France as well as the, as the Giro. Um, so we came into that race not as prepared as what we would be for a Tour de France because it's very hard to peak for both of those races. Of so we were trying we were trying to peak for the Tour. Um, so we didn't come in like on optimal body composition and quickly realized during the race that we were probably a little bit too heavy to climb with some of the world's best riders. So even from stage 10 onwards, we were losing weight during the race. Um, but we knew then that the, in the last week, if we were close to our optimal body composition that we could then super fuel those last couple of days because we knew the demands of the event in those last couple of days. The race was going to be won or lost on those stages, regardless of how you actually arrived at those stages anyway. We knew you could lose minutes in those stages. Um, but the actual race fueling plan and the tactical strategy of that stage wasn't really developed until the, the 24 to 48 hours beforehand. Mm 
and the results were astonishing, I might say. Uh, it really was an amazing moment to witness as it happened and definitely one of the greatest moments in cycling. Uh, according to data revealed afterwards by Team Sky, uh, Chris ingested almost 19 grams of carbohydrates on that day with 96 grams per hour during the six hours of the race. These are, of course, extreme amounts of, of carbohydrate to be ingested for any cyclist and for any person for that matter. Um, and taking into account that Chris is an outstanding athlete, of course, and that he can probably spend hours on top of the bike with almost no carbs and must have days where his carbon energy intake are both really low. Um, how does one manage to attain this level of uh, metabolic flexibility uh, with Chris of, or any other rider? Um, did you implement any gut training protocols in order for him to be able to digest such high amounts of food while on the bike? Or do you consider that cyclists can achieve this level of uh, carbohydrate ingestion without training the gut yeah well I, I don't think it's as difficult for cyclists as what it is for um, other endurance athletes like runners for instance um, what I would say about that volume of carbohydrate is, is to remember that it's if you split the day into two phases almost you've got your breakfast getting ready for the stage then you've got your in-stage fueling but then you've got phase two which is recovery from the stage and your evening meal and that's getting ready for stage two or for the stage the next day. And so if you split that 19 grams per kilo into two phases before the stage and in the stage and then after the stage in your evening meal, then it almost doesn't become as um, as, much. as unbelievable as what it sounds, actually. Mm-hmm. Having said that, the 95 grams or 96 grams per hour that Chris suggested was the highest that we've done in the time that I was in the team. Um, but we knew the way that it was going to be raced. He was going to be time trialling on his own for three and a half hours, which is pure carbohydrate dependency. And, and even in the footage and in the interviews that Chris has done since, he even says by his own admission that he was completely empty by the end of that stage. Yes. And, and there's no way that he could have ridden the way that he rode that day if it hadn't have been fueled by carbohydrate. And that extreme example right there may be a way of showing the importance of nutrition in such a decisive moment such as it was and I, I can only imagine how full Chris must have felt uh, throughout the stage uh, taking every opportunity to put something in his mouth and the logistics that was involved and um, regarding time trials performance James uh, this is a topic that uh, is not that much uh, discussed on, on how to proceed on those days regarding the pre-race meal uh, since in the majority of the cases athletes don't have feeding opportunities what nutritional factors uh, would you take into consideration for the specific days well the biggest challenge that we had on time time days actually was the logistics of fueling because normally there might be well you don't get the timing of your your start until the night before so usually the night before the time trial, you're then trying to work out the logistics. Most of the riders would do a little rollout on the turbo or on the roads in the morning time. So you'd have your breakfast, then you would go for your, um, you might do a little session in the morning, then you would have your lunch, then you would go to recon the course in the afternoon. Then of course you might have something after the recon before the actual TT itself. But the big challenge really was to try and get the volume correct across that time period but of course it's a lot more lighter than the other days and it was a lot more simpler usually the riders want to start quite light in the guts so they certainly don't want to feel heavy when they start that stage Um, so we would go less carbohydrate on the time trial days and we would think carefully about when to deliver that carbohydrate and then of course the warm-up is the usual warm-up strategies James, and since stomach comfort may be a, a critical factor for time trial performance, especially taking into account the aero positions that riders need to maintain throughout the race, would you say that the recovery from the previous day might be more important than the pre-race meal for time trial performance? Yeah, the day, the day before can be critical for a time trial, especially if you've come off the back of a big mountain stage. Um, so again, we, we used to think of Grand Tours as, as blocks of racing. That you might have three or four day blocks, and we'd split the race into the different blocks. And if it was a big mountain day before TT, then of course recovery was critical. 
Um, so we make sure that we recover well because it's all about how you start the TT. And, and if you don't start that TT with a level of glycogen that is sufficient to fuel that ride, giving what we know about glycogen and high intensity performance, even if it is a short effort, your performance is still going to be compromised. Yes, and the way I see it, I don't know if you agree with me, James, recovery still seems to be uh, the most or one of the most overlooked uh, aspects in, in sports nutrition in some uh, in some cycling teams and some endurance athletes that seem to uh, not take this into into account or give it the, the importance it deserves. And in, in cycling, um, it may be especially important during uh, multi-stage races where the first four hours may play a, a key role in, in glycogen resynthesis and muscle recovery but um, whether it is for not being hungry right after racing or simply because riders don't prioritize this particular moment um, and how crucial uh, may it be for the next day's uh, performance um, did you also struggle with recovery with your riders uh, especially in your early moments on team sky what challenges did you face and how did you go about them Yeah, re recovery was one of the biggest things that surprised me, actually, when I joined um, the world of cycling, not just in in Team Sky, but across the whole board. You know, when you speak to other teams, it was kind of a, a real simple thing, which I thought was being overlooked, and they weren't recovering well enough. And so one of the things that we changed most when I first started was those first three or four hours of recovery. And that was a, a big team-wide approach, really getting all of the carers and the chefs and everyone on board, the bus drivers. In the end, we got to the point where when a rider recovered each stage, they would have their own recovery protocol with the correct amount of food for that rider, which was based on an assessment of the body composition, but also the workload they'd just done on the bike. And I think recovery is a real, it's such a simple area in knowledge, but harder to bring to life in delivery. And if you can get the delivery side right, you'll definitely see improvements in performance. Let's hope that message sinks in and that nutritionists and possibly cyclists hearing this episode get the message of how important recovery is. And uh, it is up to us nutritionists to try and help with this delivery that James was referring to, which is basically the, the translation to the recommendations uh, to food or supplements uh, that might help us uh, guarantee those 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo per hour, at least in the first two hours hours post race when in a multi-stage race in a consistent manner so uh, now into a more uh, delicate topic james um food eating disorders in cycling and this is a, a topic that we we started tackling here a bit with uh, dr nikki key where she studied uh, cyclists and observed uh, low levels of uh, bone mineral density and low testosterone um, and uh, it was somehow related uh, with uh, low energy availability as part of the the so-called reds um, and since the early ages cyclists have been uh, known to intentionally reduce their food intake in order to achieve a race weight uh, since uh, a part of your background and experience has been to also deal with uh, combat sports where this is also a reality what struggles did you have uh, while working with your riders if you had any um, what symptoms or uh, signals must a nutritionist uh, look out for uh, when working with a cyclist uh, and uh, how can we deal with this uh, problematic yeah well look i think All cyclists will have low bone mineral density, which I don't think is down to low energy availability. It's just because of the lack of an osteogenic stimulus that they've had over the course of their whole career mm -hmm. and the lack of loading that they get every day. Um, so I don't think you can read too much into bone mineral density from an energy availability point of view in this population. I think you can tell a lot from the endocrine markers. Um, if you measure those routinely, you'll be able to see if a cyclist is starting to suffer. But of course, rather than measuring the outputs, let's measure the inputs, with the inputs being actual energy intake in the first place. And I'm not sure that we routinely measure energy intake enough, nor do we constantly relate that back to performance and performance on the bike, as well as the athlete's subjective daily well-being. And if you measure those three things consistently enough, along with some biochemical markers, such as the endocrine markers, then I think you'll give yourself a good chance of, of minimizing any um, symptoms of REDS or underperformance. Uh, 
But the challenge is, like all athletes will do, is they'll push things to the extreme. Yes. But it's having it's having a clear performance plan to say, look, we were going to peak for three weeks in July, so we don't need to start thinking about losing excessive amount of weight in January. We'll do that in May and June in order to peak for July. And that's making sure that everyone is aligned on the performance plan. Yes, about that lack of osteogenic stimulus, uh, would you agree, James, that nowadays when uh, training sessions and at least in pro cycling teams appear to be more focused on uh, strength training uh, sessions and not only on long hours on the bike um, as it was before, would you say that um, perhaps this... Um, lack of osteogenic stimulus is uh, nowadays probably improved um, compared to how it was before? Yeah, they, they might be, but I think the damage is already done by that stage, to be honest. Hmm. Um, we have done lots of studies with jockeys over the years. We even see that apprentice jockeys have low bone mineral density at 17, 18 years of age. But of course, they've been riding a horse throughout their adolescence. They haven't been doing any loading. We've had some jockeys in the lab who have been boxers as well, who have been running four, five, six miles every day when they were an adolescent and they don't have low bone mineral density. So I think in those sports, because of the lack of an osteogenic stimulus, that's the reason why you have the low bone mineral density. And the damage is probably already done. Some of our heavier cyclists who definitely don't have low energy availability, they also have low bone mineral density. Yes. And, and nowadays it's too easy to, to get into a, a radical food pattern. What sort of relationship with food do you believe that we should encourage as nutritionists working with athletes in general? Well, I think I've always tried to teach and coach that all food has a purpose um, and, and educate the athlete on the different types of macronutrients and what they do and why they're all important. And, and to realize, therefore, that It's not a negative relationship, it's a positive relationship and that you need it to perform. Carbohydrates, the classic example. Most people these days seem to have a phobia of carbohydrate and then very slowly but surely they realize that actually it makes them go faster. So it's, it's coaching that food, all types of food has a purpose and if you relate it back to performance then hopefully you'll get a much better buy-in. Really, really important and balanced message to leave our listeners with in a world of uh, nutrition mayhem nowadays. Uh, and we couldn't end this episode without mentioning your recent uh, research on the paper-to-podium matrix along with uh, Andreas Kasper and um, Graham Close. Um, you provide a valuable checklist of criteria uh, needed to perform a critical evaluation of performance nutrition-related uh, research papers. And uh, regardless of this, James, um, I struggle with something in the current times, which is the, the fact that I wonder if you have this same perception as me, but uh, I just see so many people using research in a futile way, you know, posting PubMed links on Facebook and on conversation comments and doing the usual um, cherry picking uh, of uh, investigation just to prove their own arguments and conveniently not mentioning the total amount of evidence on, on that particular topic. So uh, with this in consideration, would you agree that some of us trying to interpret or perform or even expose research on social media um, we are all still lacking on the basic research related knowledge in order to be able to properly apply this model what challenges uh, do you believe that need to be um, overcome in order to for both coaches and nutritionists to be able to apply this model and translate the, the theoretical knowledge into practice Well, I think that was one of the reasons why we wrote the paper in the first place, um, was to give give people a, a framework for which to critically evaluate the quality of a research paper through a list of, of structured questions. And I, I think it's pretty simple, really, that most if you want to critically evaluate a research paper, then you should be trained in research methods. So I would say that anyone whose role it is, is to read research and then translate that into practice, should have a strong research methods training. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have a PhD. Having said that, the philosophy of our group in Liverpool is that we want to try and produce high-quality nutrition practitioners 
but who are also research trained. And so most of our PhD students will also work in sport. And that's the reason why Graham and I are really trying to push that, is to make sure they're grounded in science and research methods training. Now, when it comes to the coaching side of things, it's unrealistic to expect a coach to be trained in research methods, but that's why the support staff work with the coaches. And so therefore, you then need the skills to be able to translate that research into super simple language that the coach understands. But of course, the research has to have relevance to the elite environment in the first place. So there's lots of things to unpick there, really. But it's, it's that fundamental ability to critically evaluate a research paper that underpins all of it, I think. Sure, that paper definitely is a step in the right direction and hopefully the message sinks in that um, not everyone is uh, trained in research uh, in order to be able to use it the way it has been used uh, in the past years, especially on social media. And uh, we are about to wrap up here, James. What final message or messages uh, could you leave us regarding the importance of nutritionists in pro cycling, especially for teams who still haven't recognized the importance of integrating these professionals in their stuff? Well, there's lots of messages really that we could we could leave with. And I don't think it has to be specific to cycling. I think when we consider all sports, really, there's, there's very few things that you can directly control in sport. And yet what you eat before, during and after your training sessions or competition can directly affect your training adaptations, your body composition, health, performance and recovery. And so when you consider it that way, then it's, I mean, it's fundamental, really. Every gram counts. Every staff member can contribute. And actually, what gets measured from a nutritional point of view really can make a difference. So I would say that really nutrition can be the difference between winning and losing. And it's trying to convince everyone that it really is that important. And that's not just specific to cycling. It's across all sport. And what developments in performance nutrition related research would you like to see in the next 10 years? Well, there's lots of specific research questions that we'll all have. Um, I would say probably one of the biggest challenges that we have, and we touched upon this earlier, is, is making the research relevant to the elite population and designing research trials that are, that are really relevant to the elite. And that's both for males and females. As we all know, there's very little research in females in sport. Yes. Um, yes. But I think it's really trying to design those trials correctly so that it has practical relevance for the specific population of interest that we're working with. Terrific, James. And uh, if people want to uh, follow your updates on social media or contact you, where can they go to? Um, people could drop me a message on Twitter or an email. No problem. My Twitter is, is at J-A-M-E-S-Y Morton, M-O-R-T-O-N. So just drop me a message and I'll be glad to get back to you. Perfect. These links will be on fuelthepedal.com on the page of this episode 14. And James, I can't really express how thankful I am for your time. It was an honor to be speaking to you here today and having your insights on all these topics. And for that, James, I am truly, truly grateful for your time. Thank you. No problem. Thanks very much. And that was it for the two episodes with Dr. James Morton. I really hope you have enjoyed this uh, pretty special episode with one of the people who, in my opinion, contributed the most for the field of sports nutrition, in particular to cycling-specific nutrition. Thanks to his experience, not only as a performance nutritionist on Team Sky, but also having another foot on the research field. I really believe we have some really important quotes and messages to take from this podcast. The list of guests keeps on expanding and I promise you there will be some really interesting and different topics coming soon. So stay tuned for what is yet to come. My name is Gabriel Martins. Thank you so much for listening and staying with us until the very end of this episode. I hope to have you here quite soon for another episode of Feel the Pedal podcast.